What's up, Feel Good Fathers? Welcome to the show. I have Keith Allen Johns with me today of One Big Change. We're chuckling because we had a little bit of a joke about uh, podcast hosts not always getting your name right. Mm. And as Jay Twining, I get called Jay Twinning all the freaking time. I bet. <laughs> I've actually had one host that was great that said, did I say your name right on air? And then we went back and re-recorded the intro. Oh, that's cool. So that It happens super rarely. Uh, my man, Keith, I'm really excited to have you on the show. I'm pumped too, Brody. Excellent. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about One Big Change. Yeah. Um, you know, I started my business three and a half years ago. Not really sure what it was all about. I knew I had gone through some major transformations in my life and my mm. journey was definitely not linear. And I had to learn a lot about what it took to be a man, what it took to be a dad, what it took to feel good about me and myself internally. Um, and I hit a spot where bringing that to the world, where helping people in a way I was able to get help wasn't aligned with what I was doing in corporate. So I started my side hustle. And my first side hustle uh, was about mindset, and but, but mindset around finding a new job. And I built that up and I was able to leave corporate. And then I had a, no, a new product called uh, the Solopreneur Launchpad. And so that was mindset and then how to launch your small business, which is what I did. And then it hit me, you know, the piece I really care about is the transformational piece. The job will never work. The business will never work until you figure yourself out and make yourself strong internally. And I'm living proof of that. I chased the wrong answers externally for 37 years. And it, I made mistake after mistake after mistake. Once I got right inside, once I identified not just one big change, but in my case, a series of one big changes, that's when things really started to turn around for me. So when I talk to someone who says, I was where you are, Keith, I'm, I'm here and I want to get here. In fact, that's where I was told I would get and I've done all the right things. What's missing? And I will drill mm -hmm. down and say, well, the first thing we have to do is we had to make one big change. And they'll point out something in their life that they want to get to work on. And when we pull that thread and we start to make that shift on something that's been holding them back, uh, it really creates an amazing domino effect of goodness. So that's what mm -hmm. I do. What is the big change? What would be that one domino of goodness? I love that sentence. Yeah. Uh, that uh, you did for your life. Gosh, for my life, I really had to learn to step into my discomfort and get comfortable being uncomfortable. I had an amazing coach. Her name was Lauren Widrick, and I was very excited. I had taken two days off of my corporate job because I was going to start my side hustle, right? And, and I was all pumped up. And she said, what are you going to do? And I said, oh, I'm going to... Um, build my website and work on my colors and work on my logo. And she said, no, you're not. And whoosh, all the anxiety hormones kicked in. Mm. Here she goes. She's going to coach me. She's going to make me do something that I don't want to do. She said, I want you to spend both days reaching out. Well, I'm an introvert. And at the time I was struggling with social anxiety. So you might as well have told me to like jump in a furnace. I was not very excited about it. I spent those two days doing outreach. And it changed my life, right? And see, I, that thread goes way back. When you pick the thing, when you notice what you have to change, in my case, being able to deal with discomfort so I can do courageous things that create amazing outcomes, that thread goes back a long way. You know, my father was emotionally abusive. He did his best. He was young when he had me. My mom was young. My household was not the best. I walked on eggshells my entire childhood. So seeking relief from discomfort that's baked in right mm. but that doesn't make any sense as an adult why is that holding me back still why am i scared to talk to people why am i scared to reach out to people that was going to be a major hindrance and so getting comfortable with discomfort was one of the first big changes i brought into my life and it has changed it's changed everything to the point where later today i'm going for contrast therapy into the sauna into the cold plunge, into the sauna, into the cold plunge, because I recognize that the more I push myself out of my comfort zone, the more resilient and capable I will be. So absolutely love that. And just to kind of hark in a couple of points there, yeah. 
at, as in brand strategy and personal brand strategy at brand builders group, we talk a lot about doing the right things, but in the wrong order. Mm. And so a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of solo printers, just like yourself, they come to us and they're like, I've got the website, I got the funnel and I got all this kind of stuff. And we're yeah. like, great. How's your lead gen? <laughs> and yeah. they're like, what's lead gen? And we're like, perfect. You should come work with us because <laughs> that's exactly what happens. And we say the same thing, yeah. get on the phone, uh, go get, go get some clients. Cause that it is so much easier to yeah. grow your dream, grow your passion, have the impact that you want to have, create one big change when you've got somebody in front of you that you're serving and that you're helping do that. So absolutely love that piece. Yeah. I'll tell you a quick story to make it really relatable. So, cause I think everyone will resonate with this. <clears throat> I had a client come to me and we start the, we start the group coaching and that's the lead question. All right, guys, what's one thing that could really change your life that you'd like to get to work on? And Matt said, oh gosh, you know, I've seen my mom's health and I see I'm headed, I'm headed down the same road, Keith. If I don't watch what I do, if I don't get in the gym, I am, I'm going to be just like she is having trouble walking, having trouble getting around in her older years. I don't want that. I said, great. Why aren't you going to the gym? Oh, I don't want to go to the gym. I don't like going to the gym. Now, an easy way around that would be to say, well, let's pick something else or let's discipline you or let's create an accountability form. But I'm a coach, so I get curious because he comes across as a really confident guy. Why don't you like going to the gym? You know, I'm not sure. I said, all right, let's do a visualization exercise. I want you to pretend you're getting in your car. You got your duffel bag, you got your water bottle, right? And you're driving to the gym and you park in the parking lot. And you get out of your car and you walk up to the front desk and you say hi to the greeter and you scan your card and you go back and you see people working out. Now, tell me how you feel. It's like, oh, God, get me out of here. Like, Ooh, OK, we touched a nerve. So what thought popped into your head that triggered that little anxiety attack? He said, oh, I'm scared they're going to judge me. And his eyes got big, right? So see, his one big thing was getting his, one big change is getting his health in order. But you've got to go a level deeper, right? And that's where a coach can help you really get to the root of the problem. You know, my coach could have just said, make the calls, go do it. But we had to understand why I was scared so that I could overcome it permanently. So I could be on these podcasts talking to you and feel totally natural with no anxiety whatsoever. Mm. So this client, Matt, realizes he's got a fear of judgment. And it's permeating his entire life. This isn't about going to the gym. This is about his relationships with friends. This is about his ability to grow his business. This is about his relationship with his wife. We've pulled on one big change that needs to happen for him. But here's what's cool. We shrink it down in these little micro moments. I didn't even force him to go to the gym and rewire. Instead, you know what he did? While he's walking his dog up and down the trail, Instead of having his head down, staring at his shoes, hoping to avoid people, he's been walking his, head, walking his dog with his head up and saying hello and getting a little more confident and a little more confident and a little more confident. And he's building to the point where he will not give a rip what he thinks other people are thinking of him. And that's mm -hmm. going to make him bolder in business, bolder in his relationships, and he can walk into any gym he wants to. And he's doing it by identifying the root and then taking small steps to reprogram it. That's the power of one big change. I absolutely love the beginning of visualization. It's something that I teach Feel Good Fathers as well, and I'm a really big proponent of it. I don't think most people know how, how to visualize. And so yeah. in, in sort of the stuff that I take teach about with visualization, putting together your Oh goodness, your dream chart, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's a big piece of it is exercising uh, your mind. And for the listeners, I'm pointing at my head. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it all starts with like, I usually start with colors. Mm. So take like actually inflate a little balloon, go buy like a, a set of balloons at party time or whatever the heck party store you want or the convenience store around the corner. <laughs> Uh, I just showed, I actually, actually just realized I just showed my Canadian roots there. Cause I don't think they call it a convenience store in, in the States. I think it's a drug store. Drugstore. Store. Yep. Yeah. It's a drug store. We call it convenience. I got you. So, uh, <clears throat> grab your balloons, inflate them and, and make sure like they're fluorescent. So you get like the red. 
is like just sit there in the red and then get the image of the red balloon in your head. Mm. Then do a green one, get the green in your head, get a blue one, get the blue in your head and like, and get it to the point where you can command it, command that balloon in there. And you'll find is that like, because you've taken something that's in the external world and brought it internal to that level of uh, fidelity, just with your colors over time, you'll develop more and more things Mm. and it'll just, it'll come second nature. So you'll be able to see something that you want in the world or just imagine something because you you've developed that muscle. I love it. Which is funny. That's a great exercise. Yeah. Yeah. So at the, the bookend to what Matt did would be, you know, once I put you through the nightmare of visualizing yourself walking into the gym and feeling miserable. Now let's, let's visualize you walking into the gym and feeling utterly unflappable and confident because that's what he really wanted. I love, I also love the ease with which with the right questions yeah. that you can, somebody can very easily hit the, hit the solution that they're looking for. Yeah. I'm, I'm known to say with the right five questions, you can have a relationship with anybody. Hmm. But I think yeah. if we were to extrapolate it based on what you're learning with the right set of questions, you could discover any, any truth. Yeah. One of the first books I bought when I got a taste for coaching and was told I might have a little bit of talent there. It was a book by uh, Hal Gregerson called Questions Are the Answer. And I read a couple other books too, but that one really stood out to me. Um, and I was fascinated. I was I was in a uh, executive training group called Vistage. And I had never worked with someone who led a group and had no answers. Someone who was paid a lot of money to lead our group. And all I did was ask questions and they were so good. I mean, they were mm-hmm. like these spears and it would just nail you. And I realized what he was doing. And so those two influences, that that organization and that book, have made me really focus on my ability to ask questions. Because when I ask the right ones, the answers come out of the other person. I could advise and guess all day and be wrong. But the minute the person you're talking to or working with comes to a realization on their own, and that's the magic of coaching, that's when real change can happen. So yeah, questions are powerful. They're not That's easy. Awesome. I sit here and I will try and craft it over and over and over because you got to get it just right. Yeah. Well, I think that the the result of having that practice of developing these questions and, and massaging that skill means that your your perfect process, the 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 way by which you derive answers, the way by which you help people come to those answers will it becomes second nature. Yeah. And this really sort of leads into where, where we want to take this conversation. So off where we were talking about you being super happy with like your life and where, and where it's living and I, uh, or where it's sitting. And I absolutely adore that. So there's three core areas that, uh, well, at least four, because you hinted at one in the beginning here that I'd like to cover. So what's the work, um, to being really happy with yourself as a man, as a parent, as a husband, and then with your kids. So we'll start, let's start with like, just as a man. So you've done some work. What's, what's contributed to that happiness and, and hmm. how could we help a feel good father yeah. who's figuring out such a good their question. own happiness and joy? It, that has been, in fact, that almost has to come first. Yeah, I had to get right with me. Um, unfortunately, you know, my parents didn't teach me everything I needed to know. I didn't really have... I was born in 1973, right? Like parenting was just parenting. There was there were no therapists, um, <laughs> and so I ju- it just was. And when I left the nest, I didn't really have a framework for making decisions, um, or or understanding how to maneuver as an adult. And I made mm-hmm. a lot of bad choices, and and ended up almost drinking and drugging myself into a grave, trying to fill that hole in me, that that hole from part of my upbringing. And I realized, you know, that didn't, that wasn't working for me. And I went to AA and it was the first time I'd ever been given Mm. some kind of system, some kind of program where when something happens, I have a way to make the right decision. And that's really when everything started to change for me. That gave me the first taste of working on me. And it was not easy because I had to squish my ego and listen to my sponsor and get over myself and stop thinking I was so damn smart. Um, it was quite humbling. you know. And then I went to my first therapy session and then I had my first coach. 
And I realized that I had to get comfortable in my own skin, love myself and learn how to operate with other people in a way that didn't make me feel bad. Mm. It was either my therapist or my sponsor that coined the phrase for me. And that was emotional hangover. And I said, what are you talking about? They said, well, you know, when you interact with your mom or your girlfriend and you walk away and you feel something kind of gross in your chest or your stomach, that feeling, yes, I know it quite well. That's an emotional hangover. That is a signal that you haven't hailed yourself in the previous interaction. And so, you know, we talked a little earlier about asking questions. So engaging my curiosity with, huh, well, what did I do there to be a jerk, right? What did I do wrong? What needs to change about me to start interacting differently? Um, and so I started working on how I handled external triggers, how I handled things that were going on around me. This is how I believe I've become a man I can be proud of, um, how I handle my internal triggers, the thoughts and emotions that no one on the outside sees, but clearly impact how I behave. And then I worked really hard at tackling the things I wanted to change about me. I learned it wasn't selfish to focus on self. I could stop giving to the detriment of me and call up a therapist and say, I hate having social anxiety and I'm sick of it. What can you do? And they put me to work. And I don't have social anxiety anymore, right? What Here's what I love about what you're describing, because I, I really want to touch on the therapy model yeah. and how you're leveraging it, because it doesn't work for most men. We're, we're not really built to be yeah. s- shoulder to shoulder. We're yeah. sort of built to be side by side. Yeah. But what I love about the way that you're leveraging it is you're coming with a specific result or intention. Yes. You're, you're saying, I don't want upkeep. Yeah. I want to solve this problem. Yeah. And I think if, uh, when we combine that idea with what you were describing, which is I want to take radical responsibility yes. for me, a hundred percent, I don't think there's a better description of what it means to be a man today. That's it. Totally agree. No victim, no blame, own you. And you know whether you're doing it right by how people around you feel about you, right? The great thing about how we're built is that you will have an emotional response because emotions are contagious yeah. to what's happening around you. So if you're a jerk yeah. and everybody else is feeling awkward, yeah. you'll feel that. If you're happy and joyful and everybody else around you is, is, is absorbing that as well, you'll feel that. Yeah, no question. That's great. Yeah, therapy's played a huge role for me. There's, there, the two biggest things that I called and said, let's work on this were definitely my social anxiety. And second, I was intimidated by male authority figures. And see, guys, we pick up on these things. We can pick up on these things very simply. We just finally have to slow down to go, I don't like this about me. And for me, it was when my cell phone would ring, my mobile phone would ring, and my boss's name would pop up. His name was Minoj, a perfectly wonderful man who I know loved me and cared about me and treated me amazingly. But when he would call me, I was a COO, he was a CEO, I would freak out. Is he going to fire me? Am I in trouble? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, hit cancel, hit cancel, don't answer it. It made no sense, right? I was bringing the impact of my childhood into my adulthood and I hated it. I hated feeling that way. So I call up my therapist and say, let's get to work on this. By the time we were done, when that phone would ring and it was Minoj, I felt nothing, nothing but curiosity. Such a healthier place to be in. Cognitive behavioral therapy has been very powerful for me. Um, I actually think therapy and coaching go very well hand in hand. Um, Therapy is fantastic for healing the past, putting the past in perspective, getting those kinds of tools. And coaching for me is all about, okay, building your future and what's next there. And so I've had a coach and a therapist almost constantly for five years. That's awesome. Way to do the work. Well done. Thanks, man. How about um, happy as a parent? Yeah. So again, guys, if you slow down and, and, and stop being on the conveyor belt of life and pay attention to how you feel and when you feel good about how you're doing and you feel bad about how you're doing, instead of just glossing it over or blaming your wife or your kids, 
actually, like you said, taking responsibility for it. So my lab is right over here over my right shoulder. It's called my living room. And it is usually occupied by my, my amazing wife and my 16-year-old stepson and my five-year-old boy. So I go from this amazing environment talking to someone like you, Jay, to the real world out there. And it's where the hits the fan. And so I'm sitting in my recliner watching the moving parts go around, realizing that we're having the same conversation night after night after night. We're saying the same things. I'm saying the same things. I'm showing up in the same way. And I'm walking up the stairs at the end of the night. And I'm not happy with how I feel. So see that little operational space where you observe how you're operating in the world and reflect. Oh, that is where the magic is. It helps to have a coach, but you can learn to do it on your own. And so I was very gentle. Hmm. Well, Mr. Big Shot Coach, since every time you open your mouth, you regret what you say to your family, what would happen if you just kept your mouth shut? And my ego threw a fit. No, your, your kids need to be controlled. Your wife needs to be told. Things need to be corrected. In other words, in order for me to be at peace, I must orchestrate and puppet my family so they don't tick me off, which is an absolutely absurd approach. So for a month, guys, you can go try this. I practiced keeping my mouth shut to see what would happen and not responding to every little thing, not jumping on them for trying to like bake and push and mold my family to be what I need them to be. Instead, I shut my mouth. I held space. It gave me a couple minutes to think about whether I could say something effectively or not. Because see, we were on this autopilot where everybody was just saying the same things. Your cup was in the sink. You didn't take out the trash. And then the teenager says what the teenager says. And then I lose my temper because the teenager should know better. And then they come at me and it's like, wow, why am I repeating this insanity? You know, you can get off that train. But I, I couldn't do it until I slowed down and paid attention to how I was showing up. And I shifted that. So now I'm much quieter and more effective as a parent. But there's so many other things that I've been able to shift that's helped with parenting. Being present putting my phone mm -hmm. away, knowing how magical having a five-year-old is. The reason I quit my corporate job, one of the reasons is I was leaving at 5 a.m. and getting home at 5 p.m. And my son was getting my leftover time and my leftover energy. And I thought, man, I didn't have a son until 45 because of the troubles I had in my 30s. I'm going to miss it. I'm not going to miss it. And when I do show up, I'm not a very good version of myself. And that hurt. And so, one, making myself a good man who I know I'm comfortable with my own skin. Two, figuring out how to be a good parent. Such rewarding and challenging activities. Because by default, I've got my dad's patterns imprinted on me. I've got society's patterns imprinted on me. And I will repeat the John cycle of emotional abuse if I don't stop it. I will act just like my dad did to me and his dad did to him and his dad did to him. So I took the idea of being a cycle breaker and making myself into a good dad very seriously. Am I perfect? No, but I feel those emotional hangovers less and less and less because I'm practicing showing up differently. Every time one of them does something, I want to lose my temper over, I want to correct, or I want to have a problem with. I love the uh, take a couple breaths. Reminds me a little bit of... Uh... Uh, Mel Robbins, you know, five set, what is it? Five seconds countdown from five and then go or something like that. Yeah. That's more for courage, but right. the, it's really reminded me of the conversation with Chesley Lundy where he talks about didactic learning. And mm -hmm. so that being that when information, the specific lesson was when information is hitting us as fast as it does, even in a contextual environment. So family, living room, kitchen table, work, social media, wherever, if there's too much information, which if you're, you know, at home, it can be a lot like maybe the yeah. game's on or you're having a conversation and 20 different things are going on at, at once, which is standard life mm -hmm. at home yep. <laughs> that you default to the emotional, the emotional response, which yeah. is already the emotional response is the pre-built cycle that you've learned your habits and routines. Yep. And I love the, and I really wanted to comment here because it's not, your message is not keep your mouth shut, dad. Right. 
that's not your message. And I think that needs to be super clear. It's, yeah. it's closer to reflect on whether it's going to add value to the interaction. Yeah. Reflect on whether there's something even to say, which yeah. I think is a fantastic uh, perspective and paradigm. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It Forcing yourself to not say anything for a few days, it gives you some space to think and catch yourself. Because let's be honest, just three days ago, I fell for the trap, right? My teenager did something and my wife went to instruct and my teenager pushed back. And like you said, I was too slow. The emotion grabbed the wheel, jammed on the gas and it flew out of my mouth and we ended up in an argument and that wasn't good. And it ruins my night because I don't want to show up like that. So it takes a lot of practice to learn to override that emotion, wanting to press the old pattern button, Uh, but you can do it. Just like we were talking about off air working out, because uh, I did I did calves for the first time in a while. They're yeah. woefully underdeveloped, and um, I, I guess it was the tib muscle that I have this Charlie horse <laughs> behind my knees today. So I'm having fun hobbling around. But it's the whole idea that over time, in in about a month of continuing to do this exercise, my body and my muscles aren't going to yeah. do that. I, I think I think you said going from big tears to smaller micro tears to grow the muscle. Yeah. It's, it's the same thing that the first, the first couple of months of just practicing the slow down and catching yourself, it's, you're going to probably beat yourself up more in your head. Honestly, yeah. you're going to be harder on yourself overall, yeah. but that process, that learning, um, I love it. Cause the, the, the theme of stepping into the discomfort, the theme of, right doing the thing that's going to make you better, lifting the weight, yes. stretching the muscle, tearing it, stretching the emotional muscle, tearing that, making it better. Uh, it just it makes you a better person, makes you a better parent. It's all mental muscles and it translates so well to the, to the gym analogy. And, you know, what I tell my clients is um, go do this thing and you're not going to feel 100% better the first time. It's going to be uncomfortable and then you'll notice it goes a little differently. So you might feel 10% better and then 20% better and then 30% better and similar to strength, right? And all of a sudden, eventually over time, you look at the phone, you see it's your boss and you have no anxiety, but that will not happen the first through 15th time. And those that bridging period between the old behavior and the new behavior is when your patterns and your psyche and your ego, they're going to flood your system, right? They're going to say, we don't like that you're changing. Please stop it. Here's some cortisol to get your attention, Keith. Why are you changing anything? But those systems are baloney most of the time, right? That old system kicking in, trying to protect you from something that's not a real risk. That's the discomfort and that's the work is that bridging period where it doesn't feel good to get to the point where it does. And then you go, oh, wow, now I don't feel that thing anymore. I feel great in that same circumstance. Isn't that what we all care feel- about? Don't we want to feel good? A hundred percent. Feel good father. We absolutely do. How do you manage the fuel or what would you say about the fuel to see and pursue a goal larger? And, and here's why, right? If we're stuck in reactionary mode, yeah. if we're stuck in small scale thinking and we have small goals and we're just trying to make it day by day, hour by hour, just to the point where we can go to bed, where everything gets quiet and get up and it gets loud again. Yeah. And that's our life. Yeah. Right. What allows for the, to beat that reaction, to beat that cortisol is, is in my estimation, I have an opinion of, of what it is, but I, I'm, I'm curious about the strategic versus tactical here. Can you ask it again? Absolutely. So long-term goals and having a pursuit, we okay. know that part of that the pursuit, the anticipation, the creation yeah. is a big piece of satisfaction. Yeah. That you're, uh, it's called, um, say you have a vacation. It's much better not to make it a surprise. It's much better mm. to communicate very openly yeah. that you're going on vacation in, in three months. Okay. Uh, we've been planning for the past two months to hit. Uh, Hogwarts. We're going down to Universal yeah, yeah. Uh, in, 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 you know, in, at, at some point, yeah. trying to make this timeless. So you're letting the excitement build up, the anticipation. That's part of the sweetness. Yes. And so yeah. we're enjoying and living this over time. Yeah. 
And so even, even if you're working this emotional muscle and the cortisol's activating and you're not able to make the change, uh, yeah. what's the fuel? How do you enjoy that part? Yeah. Yes. The cool thing is, so there's a, you probably have seen it. There's a documentary on Netflix called Stutz and it's, um, Stutz. Yes. S T U T Z. And it's with, uh, the actor Jonah Hill. It's his psychotherapist. It is brilliant. And what he says, and I find it very empowering, he gives tools just like I do, right? We, we play this, this guy Stutz and I, we play in the same arena. I give you tools is what he says. They can change your experience in the moment. Now, what he doesn't say is it's going to fix everything the first time you do it, but you will feel a little different. I was talking to somebody from Iceland earlier today and having an amazing conversation about these same ideas. He said, if I can just crack someone's egg, if I can just open the door and show them they feel a little better, then they'll have hope. And so I have a, a, a model. I say it's called bronze it. Because see, what will happen is I'll send a client like, like Matt out to walk his dog and make eye contact. And the question isn't, are you over your fear of judgment? Because that's crazy. Uh, even though the tool worked in real time and was effective. No, but I felt a little something bronze it. In other words, let's celebrate that moment. Let's celebrate the win. Let's dip this in and not take it for granted. Because what it's easy to do is to pay attention to the lack, right? The fact that you're not at the finish line yet. But I want you to enjoy the incremental growth over time because some things take more time to fix. Some things can change right in the moment with the right tool. Those tend to be things that are a little less deeply ingrained. I've experienced it. Some things take more repetition, right? So you focus on the outcome and you recognize that what you want, like with the vacation, is getting better and better and better every day. But the excitement of the growth and the bronzing of those moments is the sweetness. Because what happens once you get to the finish line and like me, you don't really deal with social anxiety again, or like Matt will soon, not so much fear of judgment anymore. I guarantee you, you will ask this, what's next? Because it feels so good to get comfortable in your own skin, to be showing up the way you want to for the people you care about, that you're going to want to keep upgrading your game. I love that. That sounds, that sounds, that sounds really, really great. And it really, we've been talking a little bit about the hormone systems, yeah. right? You're activating both the serotonin and the dopamine, right? Yeah. You're pursuing the goal. So you're hitting it. You're getting your little dopamine fix, which is, making it more attractive to you to do, you're right. increasing that. And then you're also getting your serotonin because you're just showing up as a better person, yeah. uh, which I love. That's really fantastic. Your, your brain, your mind, your physiology, your endocrine system, guys, I got news. None of them are really, really created by default to make you happy. They're just not. Your physiology is designed to keep you alive, but there's good news. You can leverage it in your favor. You just have to learn how it works. Someone the other day said, physiology is psychology. Hell yes. If you can't figure out why your body and brain are responding the way they are, you're going to be stuck. You got to mm -hmm. understand this meat sack you've been put into, right? It's like this is your earth spacesuit, and you're a spirit, right? And I don't care if you believe in religion or not, but there's a life energy to each of us. Call it consciousness, call it soul, whatever. There's something that's uniquely you, and it's in this this earth astronaut suit and the astronaut suits a pain in the butt, right? It sees a hose and it thinks it's a snake. It sees your boss's name on the phone and thinks you're going to get fired and live under a bridge. That's your physiology, right? Mm. But when you start to use the systems in your favor, right? Like you just discussed how to trigger the good hormones in ways that are based around good behaviors and ways that you actually want to conduct yourself. You know, people call it life hacks or body hacks, whatever. I just believe you need to understand the role of your brain, the role of your mind, and the role of your higher self and how to use those systems to your favor. So yeah, we're on the same page on this. Love it. How about happiness as husband? Mm, that's a good one. I didn't, you know, I never thought I would get married. I never thought I would have kids. Um, what can happen when you're um, abused in any way as a child is called arrested development. You get stuck. And you're like 13 for life. And you've seen people like this. You know, the man child who never grew up, 
the guy who's 40 and still going out and getting hammered with his frat buddies. Like, oh, God, Bob, really? <laughs> and I realized that that was, that was where I was. And once I started to rebuild myself and, and feel better about me, I felt called to have a family. And uh, I got married. And I reached out to my coach and I said, I got a question for you. Does the person you marry have to be into self-development work too and be growth oriented and know all this stuff and watch the Stutz Netflix show and, and, you know, read the books I read. And, and I was shocked. She said, Oh, my partner's not into any of that. See this guru in my life, this mindset guru, her partner wasn't into it. So I thought this could go okay. But then you realize you're moving at two different speeds. Right, that person isn't into self-development work, but they're a perfectly fine person. But you have to hold expectations accordingly, and you have to learn how to hold space for them to grow at their own pace, right? Especially as we work together as parents. And so, this is another massively humbling piece for me um, to not be the smartest one in the room, to not be the one who's most mature and advanced spiritually. Like, cut that noise out right? You two are on the same level. How, how can you communicate with your wife and partner with your wife in a way that's best for the relationship and that's best for your kids? And I had to get over myself, man. I had to really bring myself down a few notches and seek to deeply understand her and where she came from. And above all, what has helped us most is that we model the desired behaviors we want to see in each other. Instead of fighting or bickering, or trying to control, or lecture, or indicate when I am displeased. We act how we'd like the other person to act, and amazing things happen. Uh, I decided long ago that when I lose my temper with my five-year-old, that I will apologize with no equivocations at eye level, no matter what he has done. So consistently, when I lose my temper with Parker, once I get control again, I will get down on a knee, eyeball him, and say, son... Daddy did not handle that well when you spilled your milk and I didn't mean to shout and I'm very sorry and I'll do my best so it doesn't happen again. And there's no but. I never say, but you shouldn't have put the milk there. No, I do it with no equivocations. Mm. You could have knocked me over with a feather a couple months later when my wife lost her temper. She's Italian. I love her. Wasn't always big on the apology. Came back in the room a few minutes later, got on her knee look my son in the eye and apologize with no equivocations. That's same page parenting, right? Mm. You know, and it helps that at the end of the day, we talk about how things went at the end of the week, we reflect on how things are going and we do it naturally. We don't have to schedule it while we're driving. We pull up. How are the kids doing? How are we doing? We intentionally talk about things. It's back to that observational mindset that I talked about earlier, where you just observe a little bit. How are things going? And I have grown so much as a husband and gotten to be a better person through her. And I'm so appreciative because I was, I could be quite an arrogant ass a lot of the time. And I thought I was always right. And I've learned so much better. And I feel better about me having humbled myself to learn how to be a husband. Love it. Uh, I love all, I love everything you've been saying. I, the, the, the core question, and I think you answered this that I had was how are you, how are you determining sort of the desired behavior in each other? It, that yeah. seems like a solo journey. I'm, I'm kind of curious what, what's the discussion there? Um, anytime I feel like you know, the emotional hangover is the cue, right? When I handle something and afterwards I still feel at peace inside. I know I'm doing whatever it is the right way. That's my North Star. I know when my wife loses her temper that it's not healthy for the child and it's not healthy for her. So that becomes something that I try to model with a great degree of intention. Now it goes both ways. So if I'm getting an emotional hangover after a certain kind of interaction and I see my wife handle it differently, watch me change. And then what I'll do is I'll go tell her. I'll say, hey, you know that, that thing you did with my stepson, River? Like when River did this, you did that. That was brilliant. I'm going to borrow it. So for me, it's about knowing what's healthy for our family. And so I'm able to intuit like, 
that's not being handled well by my wife, but I'm not going to sit down and talk to her on a lecture, right? I'm going to show her how I handle that situation. Does that answer your question? It does. And I, I think from the first part, it's the not being right, like surrendering that ego. But the yeah. second part is building and acknowledging the behavior that you want to see. And so that, I think that was really critical and just acknowledging like the, Hey, when you did X, I saw Y love that. That was super good. Yes. You have to catch each other. Your, all your family, catch them doing something right. We pick and pick and pick when they do things wrong, catch them doing something right. You know, what really got my attention? I was watching a video by Gabor Mate and he's, he's written mm -hmm. books and he's amazing. His story is amazing. And he said something that challenged me. He said, if you are providing unconditional love, your child will behave and do as you wish them to, and it will come naturally. Because someone had asked him, right? Like, what if the child isn't doing what I want them to um, and isn't following the rules? And he said, that's on you. And I was, that really blew my mind, right? From a, a control and command and teach point of view. And that stretched me. It's made me focus on how I show up and I see it. When I'm in a good space and I ask my son to pick up his bowl and spoon on a Sunday night, he does it. When I am not in a good space on a Monday night and ask him to do the same thing, he will resist. It's a very empowering thought to think if I'm showing up right, my child will want to work for me and not against me. Little ideas like that really stretch me out and make me rethink how I show up in that that laboratory living room I've got. Awesome. Super good. I'd love to, to wrap on happiness with your kids and showing up in that way. Yeah. You know, one of the reasons, one of the things that got my attention when I decided I wanted uh, to move out of corporate was I just felt like we were giving away too much of our lives and too much of our dreams to a default approach to making a living. And this, this approach has only been around for a hundred some years, right? I mean, there's tens of thousands of years of being humans when we were able to survive with totally different approaches. And so, I mean, I looked around at everyone I was working with and I loved them, but I didn't feel like I was on the same page as they were. And I thought, where did my dreams go? Where did the dreams I had as a child go? See, when we're kids, we say, I can't wait till I can make my own rules, make my own money, make my own decisions and do whatever I want. And then as adults, we don't make our own rules. We don't make our own decisions. We don't do whatever we want. We finally have money and power and agency and we don't use it. Right. And so my children are a constant reminder, despite it being challenging, despite them triggering the heck out of me, despite it being a very important role to just hang out with them in their world, to remind me that their world is just as legitimate as mine. My amazing five-year-old son, I say it's bath time, Parker. The other day, he takes off all his clothes, runs around the house singing Feliz Navidad at the top of his lungs for five minutes. His life and his decisions are just as legitimate as those of an adult, right? So embracing that, isn't that hilarious? Embracing that and letting some of that lift me up. And then when we do a puzzle, man, do the puzzle with them. Don't have your phone in one hand. Don't have the football game on. Not easy habits to break. But like when I spend time with Parker, I am all there. And in the present is where the sweetness is. It's where the joy is. Time goes by so quickly with our kids. I know he's going to be 18 before I blink. I'm doing everything I can to slow that down. And the way I do that is by getting outside of me, by being with him in his world. And I've got to try to be with my teenager in my teenager's world. And that's not easy because things have changed. And his world is way different than when I was a teenager. But that's how I do it. It was a key for me to get over myself, to break myself down and be willing to be in my wife's world and play in her world and my kid's world and play in their world and not try and dictate that they come to my world. Hmm. Absolutely love that. Uh, thanks so much. If you want to learn more about Keith, go ahead and go to www.keithallenjohns.com. Yeah. That's keithallenjohns.com. Find out more information. Uh, Keith Allen Johns, everybody.